Good evening, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Daniel Sellers, and I'm honored to serve as Executive Director with MinCan, the Minnesota Campaign for Achievement Now. It is wonderful to see a full house tonight. We're fortunate this evening to have six mayoral candidates with us, and we're looking forward to this important conversation about <laughs> education and opportunity gaps in Minneapolis. As a lifelong resident of this city and a graduate of South High School, I find myself agreeing with the poll that was released by the Star Tribune this morning showing that education is the top priority for voters in this fall's mayoral election. <laughs> what better setup for tonight's event could we ask for? Before we get started, a few logistical details. First, please and thank you for keeping that back row clear. That is a requirement of the space. Second, on cue, no signs are allowed tonight by anybody, so thank you for following that direction. First, I also want to take a moment to thank our sponsors this evening. Along with MinCan, the African American Leadership Forum, and Students First are serving as lead sponsors. Co-sponsors, as you can see up here, include the Chicano Latino Affairs Council, Community Justice Project, Minnesota Minority Education Partnership, Organizing Apprenticeship Project, Put Kids First Minneapolis, Students for Education Reform, and Teach for America. As you may have heard, this event will be live streamed on theuptake.org. Out of respect for our at-home viewers, take a moment to silence your cell phones, but don't shut them off if you're planning on tweeting during the event. We'll be using the hashtag MPLSEdForum. Also, if you haven't already, I encourage you to visit the information table to learn more about ranked choice voting. As many of you know, this is a ranked choice voting election. And come election day, it's important that you carefully consider all three of your choices and rank your preferences on your ballot. The panel tonight will end at 8.15, but I encourage you to hang around until 9 p.m., grab a drink, network, and enjoy yourselves in this lovely space. Okay. Joining us tonight are Minneapolis mayoral candidates Mark Andrew, Jackie Cherry Holmes, Betsy Hodges, Don Samuels, Stephanie Woodruff, and Cam Winton. In your program for this evening, we have biographical information for the candidates who are joining us, as well as for our esteemed moderator, Dr. Nakima Levy Pounds, Director of the Community Justice Project. Please join me in welcoming our panel. I apologize about the lighting. Uh, for once, candidates, you may have to get used to not being in the spotlight. Uh, during the forum, candidates will have 90 seconds to answer questions from Nakima, 60 seconds to answer questions from the audience, and then 30 seconds or less during a lightning round. Our card holders up front here will indicate when you have 30 seconds left and when time is up. We appreciate your support, candidates, in helping us get to as many questions as possible. Before we begin, I want to share a few assumptions with the candidates and the audience, which I hope will allow us to have a discussion that's focused on what we all came here for. First off, we assume all candidates support high quality daycare, preschool, after school care, and wraparound social services for Minneapolis children. Second, we assume all candidates support a stronger job market, better public transit, better housing, resulting in the reduction in the number of students who are homeless and highly mobile. Finally, we're all aware that under current city charter, the mayor has no direct control over the schools. <clears throat> if you don't agree with the above, let us know. But I share these assumptions because the goal of this forum is to focus on education, policy, and values. We want to know how candidates plan to use the influence and bully pulpit they receive with the mayor election to strengthen our schools. Finally, I'll close with these thoughts. The group of co-sponsors and I were quite purposeful in naming this discussion one that's about an opportunity gap as opposed to an achievement gap. It's important to acknowledge that while there are different opinions about what the solutions are for closing that gap, there is broad-based agreement that we can and must do better in our city with respect to ensuring all children are given an equal opportunity to receive a great education and the life advantages that come along with that, regardless of that child's zip code, race, or ethnicity. 
And that discussion is rooted in the foundational belief that we're all here because we care about the future of our city's kids. Beth Hawkins penned a piece in MinPost today with a clarion call headline. Mayor R.T. Ryback believes that the next mayor has to be deeply engaged in the issue of education. Of course, that's true for us all. Simply put, we all must be engaged to ensure the students of this city have the opportunity to attain an excellent education in order to fulfill their potential in contributing to the vibrancy of the city we love and call home. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Ms. Levy Pounds. Good evening. It's truly a privilege and an honor to be here tonight with all of you and with our candidates to discuss an issue that is near and dear to many of our hearts, and that is the issue of education. Victor Hugo, who was considered to be one of the best and greatest writers of the 1800s, had a simple message about education. He said, he who opens a school door closes a prison. That message rings all the more true in this day and age in which the majority of the 2.4 million people who are incarcerated in this country are people in poverty and those who have been uneducated or undereducated within our school systems. There's a great deal at stake in the battle for a quality education, particularly for boys and men of color who nationally comprise 40% of the prison population. In Minnesota, Blacks comprise 5% of the population, but are 36% of our prison population. In Minnesota, fewer than half of all African American, Latino, and Native American students graduate from high school in four years. If our young people are not graduating from high school and have been undereducated and miseducated within our public school system, it's nearly impossible that they will be prepared to join our workforce and become contributing members of our society. Beyond that, their chances of entering the criminal justice system increase exponentially, as studies show that a black man without a high school diploma is six times more likely to wind up in prison. So we have some serious work to do in transforming our, our public education system in the city of Minneapolis and also throughout the state of Minnesota. We can no longer afford to wait for change to take place, but we must be the change that we hope to see in this world. And we must have the expectation that the next mayor of Minneapolis will become a change agent for transforming public education. Thus, it is in the spirit of changing paradigms that we engage in tonight's mayoral forum on education. As Daniel spoke earlier, thank you. I'm going to pose some questions to the candidates, and they will have 90 seconds to answer. Again, there are timekeepers in the front, and if you see time, please stop answering the question at that moment. Here's the first question. Nearly 70% of Minneapolis public school students are children of color. Less than half of these students are performing on grade level, and less than 38% are graduating on time. As mayor, what education policies will you push in the next four years that will give our most vulnerable children a better chance of graduating college and being career ready? We'll start with you, Pam. Sure, thank you. And, and Ms. Levy Pounds, on behalf of myself and all the candidates, are we doing opening statements or no opening statements? No, Okay. just Fair answer enough. that question. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> There had been an instruction earlier about opening, so just want to make sure we're all clear. I'm Cam Winton. Thank you very much for this opportunity. When I answer that question, I'm driven by the fact that I had a world-class public school education every day from the first day of kindergarten through my last day of senior year of high school. And on the basis of that public school education, I was able to go off and get three degrees after that and lead a great life so far in the wind turbine maintenance business. I say that not to toot my own horn, but to say thank you to the public school teachers who enabled that to happen for me. But yet, we're all seeing the same facts, that our schools are not a world-class engine of opportunity for all of our children. And we all want to see that. So as mayor, here's what I would do. 
I'd work both on the poverty side of this problem and on the policies side. Because as I've said before, and I'll say again, way too often this debate gets trapped in a stale dichotomy between poverty and policies. It's both. So as mayor, I'll get rid of the red tape that's shackling job growth in our city because parents with jobs are parents who have the peace of mind to read to their children each night. I'll ask my fellow fathers across the city to step up and do their part to create stable households. It's tough being a dad, but we all have a moral obligation to do it. And on policies, I'll push for policies that push kids first. Longer days and years, regular assessments, not high stakes testing at the end of the year, and loosening of teacher seniority rules that too often put the needs of adults ahead of the needs of children, and I'm the one candidate seeking mayoral appointments to the school board, not mayoral control, but a more of a mayor's voice on the school board. Thank you. Great. Ms. Woodruff. Thank you. I'm Stephanie Woodruff, and I'm running for mayor because Minneapolis needs to be the smartest city in America. We need to lead with one vision so that we all have skin in the game here, okay? We need to utilize our existing assets outside of the existing school system so that we can lift all of our children up. You know what Harvey Milk said it best when he said, make no mistake about it, the American dream starts with our neighborhoods. And, we, and in order to repair our cities, we have to fix our neighborhoods. But we have to first understand that the quality of life is more important than the standard of living. The quality of life has got to start with a quality education. This is appalling, our achievement gap. It's not impossible. Other cities are doing it. Schools within our system are doing it. We've got great people on this problem. But what has been lacking is leadership. There has been no leadership around this issue. When I talk to a lot of people to you know, kind of get myself up to speed, because I'm not, I'm not an educator, I asked one question. Who is ultimately responsible for this issue? And nobody could answer it. So as mayor, I'm here to bring bold leadership because I will demand results around this issue. Ms. Woodruff, I'm going to um, ask you to identify what specific education policies that you will push. Well, I think the, uh, the partnership zone that the superintendent has rolled out in terms of identifying 20 to 30 percent of the lower performing schools, um, in terms of shifting um, all of those, you know, in terms of providing the existing tools so that those schools can have a little bit more flexibility and freedom so that they can you know, target the underperforming schools. I mean, there are, I mean, there are a number of different policies. It's just that there's no leadership around this. We've got to work together. The superintendent and the school board and the mayor have got to work together to, to implement these existing policies. I'm not going to write any new policy around this. I'm not a lifelong educator. This is not about policy. This is about leadership. Thank you. Mr. Samuels. Thank you, thank you. Uh, and it's so great to see you all here today. I gotta tell you, I feel like this is homecoming. Um, I've been chomping at the bit for 30 year to 40 years on this issue, from the time my son, who was 36, entered kindergarten until today, when my 14-year-old daughter is at uh, De La Salle and my 12-year-old daughter is at Anthony Middle School. Uh, I'm obsessed with education, not just for my children, I think my kids are going to be okay, but for the many thousands of kids that I've met who have failed predictably in all of the inner cities, communities that I have lived. So as mayor, I'm going to come out of the box with a bolt, and I'm going to begin to join forces with the, in partnership with the school district and all of you to make sure that we make transformative changes. I'm going to advocate for uh, school leaders to choose their own teams. I'm going to advocate uh, for testing to be done for correction and for instruction rather than for elimination and for shaming. We're going to use data and we're going to use it wisely. I'm going to advocate an end to LIFO so that we don't lose our teachers of color and our talented teachers. I'm going to uh, advocate for more informed parents, parents knowing which schools are performing well and which ones are not before they send their children there. And I'll tell you the rest when my time comes back. <laughs> <laughs>
around. <laughs> Thank you. And in case I didn't mention it earlier, the organizers have given me the ability to ask follow-ups if someone isn't directly answering the question. So you may see a little bit of that tonight. Go ahead, Ms. Hodges. Thank you. The discussion about education and the opportunity gaps in the Minneapolis public schools and in Minneapolis as a whole is a set of adult-centered debates at the moment. And if we have child-centered conversations, we can transform the debate for our kids and get some real results. The most important thing I can do as mayor is convene a table around education to get our ship sailing in the same direction. And at Mayor Hodge's table, everyone will be invited, but there will be three prices of admission. First, we have got to acknowledge the urgency. 37% graduation rates for African American children and Latino kids is unacceptable. A 70% graduation rate for white kids, not okay. Second, we have to be willing to challenge everything we think we know about education. We have to be willing to take that challenge and sit next to people from whom we are different. And finally, we have to come to the table ready to do something. I bring to the table my Cradle to K platform. I bring to the table my out of school time platform. But this debate has devolved and it is costing our kids. Teachers need, saying that teachers are workers who need more prof and professionals who need protections, you get labeled pandering to the unions. If you say we need more diversity in our teaching staff, you get told that you are an education reformer. Just a couple of weeks ago in a forum, Mark Andrews said that I had to repudiate the Koch brothers for being supported by people who support education reforms. You refer to me, I don't care. This is a campaign, I'm a big girl, I can handle it. But that refers to all kinds of people sitting in this room who care, who want to find a solution for our kids and we need to be able to do that. Child-centered conversations okay, can I'm lift us back up. I'm gonna pause right there and pick that thought back up during the next round. Ms. Sherry Holmes. Let me be very clear about what I believe the role of the mayor is in education. The mayor's role is to first and foremost host the discussion and host the conversation. It's not just a role for the mayor, it's an absolute solemn responsibility because the health and welfare of our city depends on that conversation. The mayor needs to not be afraid to take risks and the mayor not, needs to not take sides. We need to get away from rhetoric, from anger, from blaming and shaming and instead we as adults need to create an inspirational campaign for our students and our families in our city. Specifically, I support Su Superintendent Johnson's shift program. I think it's an excellent approach and I think we need to move forward with that and we need to support that. Secondly, I think the unions have some good ideas and I think we need to listen to them and engage them in the discussion. Thirdly, the work being done by the African American Leadership Forum is exemplary and I think is on the right track. But we can't have three groups all doing three different things. The role of the mayor is to bring everybody together to convene the conversation and to come to solutions and to find common ground. When I was in office before as council president, we regularly, regularly hosted uh, meetings between the school board, the city council, the mayor, the superintendent, and we got things done because we were all on the same page because we had a reason to be together and we had a dialogue going on together. That's what I'm going to do. Thank you. One of the most heartening things that I've witnessed in this campaign is the deep public interest in this issue. We have a room tonight that is filled with people who care deeply about public education, about our children, and about the future of our city. I decided to run for mayor because I want to make a great city even greater. And I led in my campaign platform with schools and the achievement and opportunity gaps as challenge number one. The role of a mayor has got to be a role of a bridge builder. We can hear a lot of rhetoric from candidates about who's controlling whom and who is, um, who is favoring any particular viewpoint. 
but I want to make a very clear statement to the people here today. My number one objective, my number one objective is school performance and improving the quality of life of our kids through better education. I will do this by being a unifier, a collaborator, and a bridge builder, skills that I have finally honed over many years and for which I am well known. Here, here. So here's the next question, and we're going to start with you, uh, Mark. What are your specific thoughts on the use of standardized testing to evaluate specific um, student performance? And please be specific. On the issue of standardized, standardized testing, I think I and most of the people in this room support some level of standardized, standardized testing. The issue I have with it is that I think we're doing too much of it. And we need to build the educational instruments that uh, achieve all of the testing uh, data uh, in a, in a uh, fewer uh, number of tests. We need to consolidate standardized te testing so students can spend more time learning and less time testing. And I kind of like uh, some of the discussion at the Common Core, in the Common Core program, at the federal level, they're talking about finding different and better data points, finding better criteria within which to do the testing. Minneapolis Department of Education is doing the same thing. Minneapolis School District is doing the same thing. So I think we're generally on the same page. Standardized testing, yes. Uh, less of it and more meaningful testing instruments, yes. Standardized testing is important to a certain extent. You know, as a parent of a daughter who's getting ready to take the ACT in about uh, two months, I want to know where she's at. I want to know what she's learning. I want to know where she compares with other kids, and I want to know what her possibilities are. But it's not about just a standardized test. And as uh, I think Mark said it well, we can't just be testing. We also have to look at continuous assessments. We have to look at academic diagnosis. And we have to intervene throughout the year. We have to use the test as an intervention tool so we can see where kids are at and how we can improve and how we can help them be better. But you know, we need to take it beyond testing. It's not just about testing. We need to look at what, what some people are referring to as social emotional learning. Because it's not just about testing. It's not just about knowing what's in that test. It's about how do we socially and emotionally engage, and how are we learning in that way, too? Because we know that kids don't just do well in school or in their career or in their life because they've done well on a test. They do well because they're socially, emotionally engaged. And we don't have a process for working with kids on that, at that level in our schools. And we really need to do that because it's more than just being able to respond on a test. It's how do you get along with people? It's how do you interact with people? It's how do you think about life? It's much bigger than just the test. We need to teach kids not to test. We need to teach kids how to learn. Thank you. The advantage of the testing we've done is that it helped highlight this opportunity gap and the achievement gap. Testing has been used uh, to give us some of the data we need to be more proactive on behalf of our kids. But when we take it too far, it means teachers' hands get tied. When you take state budget constraints plus the level of testing that's been expected, you get more of a one-size-fits-all expectation for all the children in the classroom. And so what we need to do is create some more flexibility for teachers and create some more flexibility in the classroom. Yes, we need the feedback that testing gives us. Children, when we look at this from the viewpoint of children, it is useful for them if their teachers and their parents know and can assess where they are at. But if we can't use those results and that information in a flexible way to teach children, uh, to, ta you know, to, to target our instruction to them and teachers target the instruction to them more closely to serve those individual children's needs, then, then the testing is starting to work against the greater good and the best interest. So we do need some level of testing, um, but we do not need it to the extent, because I've talked to teachers. I've talked to teachers who desperately want to serve children and also desperately feel the pressure of having to teach to the test, as it were. Uh, and we need to change that so kids can get the best outcome. 
When we start talking about kids and what they need, we start getting a more rational policy around testing. Thank you. Go ahead, Don. Thank you. Well, you know, I think we are, have a problem with our testing methodology or our testing philosophy. Right now, we're testing uh, to see how much you don't know. We're not testing to see how much we need to teach you. And uh, that's one of the things we're going to have to change. Right now, you had a big end of year test, and then the summer comes, you got the summer slide, you got mobility, you got loss of teachers, teacher turnover, come back, and the test doesn't mean anything. And so testing then becomes more punitive without any consequences rather than instructive and corrective. And that's the thing, we need to move now to a different paradigm where we test in real time to find out what a kid needs to learn in each segment of their academic journey. Every fact should be tested to see if the kid knows that fact, not to just to see how well the school or the kid is doing. And then once you know the fact the child needs to know, then you teach it the next day. We need real-time testing. As uh, uh, Jeffrey Canada said, the high stakes is today because you can do something about it. Thank you. That's great. Yes, we need test. Testing is key. I mean, it's, it's like with everything. We have to measure, whether it's in your business or in your personal life. I mean, measurement is key in terms of ensuring success. So, so there's nothing wrong with testing. But it has to be flexible, and it has to work based upon the situation. And I agree with Don on this. It has to be. There are so many tools out there where we should be testing real time, online. There are so many applications in the cloud where my idea is to make sure that every child in the school system has a tablet. So there's no child left untableted, right? And a teacher literally, real time, can be monitoring that student to make sure that they are learning, but not only to make sure that they're learning, but if they, to see if they're actually bored. And they can be pushing more out to them, right? Testing has got to be flexible so that it doesn't hinder what we're trying to do, but it is measuring the exact results that we need so that we can improve. Otherwise, I mean, you know, we're stuck kind of in this paradigm wondering why we can't move forward. Go ahead, Cam. I trust you're all hearing the consensus along the row, and it's not because we're all cheating off each other's seats, but it's because we've all read the literature that supports exactly what we're saying and, and what I believe too. High stakes end of the year tests are counterproductive. Check in quizzes along the way so that teachers can get real time information. That's productive. And to use the jargon, formative quizzes are useful, summative tests are not. And I think all of us support using more formative quizzes. So I'll use the balance of my time to respond to something that's been said earlier here. And in fact, I'll, since it's an education form, I'll, I'll phrase it in the form of a pop quiz. So here's a pop quiz. This morning, Mayor Rybeck, the cheeriest politician in the history of time, <laughs> described the education comments of Mark Andrew using which of the following phrases? A, deeply stupid, that's a quote, deeply stupid, quote unquote. B, quote unquote, reckless. C, quote unquote, garbage. D, quote unquote, wrong. Or E, all of the above. E, all of the above. I really like Mark. I, this may sound politicianed in Two-Face, but it's not. I really like Mark. Mark's track record of leadership on GLBT issues would blow your mind. He was for equality way before it was cool. Mark's track record of environmental leadership, recycling leadership, Midtown Greenway leadership, remarkable. I take my hat off to him because I benefit from it every day as a Minneapolis resident. But on education, respectfully, Mr. Andrew has cast his lot with the forces of the status quo. Please don't be fooled. I feel like I'm back in Los Angeles <laughs> instead of Minnesota. This is not a Minnesota nice debate. <laughs> Some might find that to be refreshing. <laughs> wow. All right, so we'll go to our next question. And we will, and I want us to remember that phrase, no child left untableted. I can see that on a t-shirt. I think it's, it's powerful. I know I would like that for my children. 
Um, so we'll start with um, Jackie Cherry Holmes because you, you referenced um, Superintendent Johnson's shift agenda. So in May, we know that Superintendent Johnson proposed her shift agenda for the upcoming teacher contract negotiation. Under this plan, some of the district's lowest performing schools would have an alternative teaching contract that would give principals at those schools the freedom to A, hire and retain the most effective teachers for their students, even if this means going outside the seniority system or hiring teachers not currently employed by Minneapolis public schools. B, pay these teachers more, and C, significantly extend the teaching school day and year. Do you support the superintendent shift proposal? Why or why not? Yes, I do support it. I think it's bold. I think it's thinking outside the box. I think it's moving forward in a, in a bold way. This is a time when we need to take risks. We cannot settle for the status quo and we can't settle for the same paradigms. It's bold. I support her in doing it. It's a difficult thing to do, but I absolutely support her in doing it. We have to do some things very, very differently. And I believe she's putting in place the partners she needs to put in place to be successful at do doing this. Excuse me. Um, she's got uh, the support of a large number of people in the community. I believe that this is the right thing to do. I think that we know as, as parents, those of us in the room who are parents, that kids do better when they have small class sizes when they have teachers who are engaged with them in a very personal way, which happens in a smaller uh, school environment, and when they have longer school hours. Those things we know. That's what she's aiming to do. I support her and I will do uh, anything in my power as mayor to help her be successful in her venture. Thank you. Betsy. Yes, I do support uh, the superintendent in this. Uh, we know that more time for kids helps especially kids who are struggling. More time in educational settings helps them. That includes school. We know that having teachers who can engage directly with the kids who've been chosen in part to reflect perhaps the student body that they are teaching, we know that that works for kids and creates better outcomes. And so to have the opportunity inside the Minneapolis public school system to do this and move forward on this is incredibly important if we're gonna move ahead on behalf of kids. It does two things. It allows the children in those classrooms an opportunity uh, to thrive and succeed, which is what we want. And it also gives us an opportunity to get more information about what works inside Minneapolis public school rooms. If we set up the measurables correctly, if we get the right set of data at the beginning and the right set of data at the end, and this is one place where testing can be useful, it gives us information about how things are going. We can revolutionize what's happening inside the schools. We can happen, revolutionize what's happening inside the Minneapolis public school system. And we can do it with everybody at the table. This can't happen without everybody being at the table. I think it's crucial moving forward and I applaud the superintendent for putting it forward. Go ahead, Don. Yeah, just a great idea. I think it's very progressive and it's a new day at, at uh, the MPS. But I got to tell you, it ain't going to happen unless something happens from one of the folks here on this podium who gets elected is going to be a champion and a partner with Bernadia Johnson. And it's not going to take a lot of talk. It's not going to take a lot of uh, speculation, a lot of collaboration and coordination. It's going to take courage. Because right as we sit here and as she negotiates that contract, the forces of the status quo are coming at her hard. This ain't pretty. It's Minnesota nice until the negotiations begin. And then Bernadette is going to need a human shield. And I'm a volunteer. <laughs> I'm a volunteer. I've been working out for 40 years. And t uh, eight years ago, I started the, the Hope Collaborative with Sandra, my wife, and, and, and uh, uh, Joe Nathan and others. And we brought in 10 schools that had these same kind of principles. And we put them up on uh, PowerPoint presentations at the Pre Theater. This is not new. I shifted eight years ago. I shifted from the Peace Foundation when I stepped off the board and allowed the board to form the Northside Achievement Zone with my wife as the uh, CEO. 
We shifted then. The shift has been going on for a long time, and it's time now for the entire system to shift. And I want to be that leader to lead the shift. Yes, I accept that invitation. I not only accept it, but this will be my number one focus. My number one priority will be to rally the community behind this program. Like I said, it's not about creating new policies, a new PDF file, or a 10-point policy plan. That's the superintendent's role. That's her job, and I support it 100%. I love the quote that she said when she said, it's time to get off the dime and stop protecting the status quo and stop being satisfied with poor performance. The only way that this is going to happen is that me, as the mayor, rallies the community and we all have skin in the game. My role is to make sure that that happens. So here's my guarantee. I've been a leader in business for 15 years. I've created huge values, like millions, multi-millions of dollars for my employees and my shareholders. The only way you do that as a leader is to put skin in the game. So here's the skin in the game. The mayor's salary is $106,000. My guarantee today that I will defer half of my salary, $53,000, into a separate fund. If at the end of the year, if students of color do not advance in the reading and writing proficiency, then I will not collect that other half of my salary. That salary will go to a separate fund to fund this major problem. It will fund my learning labs to make sure that every child does not go untableted. That is my commitment. Wow. I do support the shift. For the reasons that have been shared, I think it's fantastic. The shift framework is exactly the direction that our district needs to go. I was there for the speech when Superintendent Johnson unveiled the shift framework, and I believe it was May? Was it May? That was a long time ago. It's September 16th, and I've asked folks, I've asked school board members, I've asked union members for an update, how are the negotiations going? They don't seem to be making a whole lot of progress, which frankly is baffling to me. It's shocking to me. When I walked out of the auditorium after the shift proposal, I thought this is the greatest blueprint that has been handed down Bernadia was like Moses on the mountain. I'm mixing my metaphors here, but she had the tablets. She had the way forward. <laughs> Why aren't we there? And so with great respect to the public school teachers, remember how I started tonight. I went to public school for every single day from first day of kindergarten to last day of senior year. My beef is not with public school teachers. My beef is with the leaders of the Minneapolis Federation of Teachers and waiting in the wings, Education Minnesota who for too long have been allowed to prioritize the needs of certain adults over the God-given rights of every single one of the precious children that comprise our city. Where are we with the shift negotiations? Let's go. Mark. Thank you very much. Um, I want to say, I want to answer this question, but I want to say one thing about one of the representations that was made about me tonight. And I want to say this with a calm and supportive voice. Mm -hmm. I am a person who has enjoyed the support of people in our community and have never been in anybody's pocket in all of the years I have served in public office. I have been respected as an independent thinking person. I have a titanium spine and I'm not bashful about standing up to any individual or any group of people. I am here tonight because I care about our kids. And I am going to work hard to galvanize support and to pull people together. We can't have a mayor that is divisive and a bomb thrower. I will be a mayor that takes the best that organized labor has to offer and the best that the community has to offer, and the best that our families have to offer, and the best that the experts have to offer, and I will lead, and you have my promise on that score, I will lead. Tonight, I will rise above that cynicism and state categorically I'm a strong supporter in the SHIFT initiative. I support the initiative. 
I um, support the negotiations currently happening. I believe the partnership schools are the answer. We need an instrument that is going to be about uniting and not an instrument that is about dividing. Who could be against that? This is a good initiative. Thank you. If that was calm, I'd hate to see fired up and caught red-handed for the supporters that you've arrayed around yourself, Mr. Andrew. Well, I mentioned earlier this is seeming more and more like Los Angeles <laughs> and not like Minnesota. Um, so I'm going to move on to the next question. We're going to start with Betsy. Through public charter, private and parochial schools, as well as the Choice is Yours program, thousands of students of color living in Minneapolis do not attend traditional Minneapolis public schools. How do these school choices fit into your vision of closing the opportunity gap in the city? Well, a lot of families have been voting with their feet. There's a lot of discussion and conversation and debate and back and forth about whether or not charter schools work, about whether or not this program or this program works. But when we think about the kids and we think about their families, People are trying other options because they think they'll get a better result. The first thing we need to do is find out if they actually are getting a better result. And in some cases, the answer is yes. And in some cases, the answer is no. And it is up to us on behalf of the kids to find out what works best for children and make sure that that is the dominant, dominant work that we do. That means finding out what's happening in the best of charter schools. That means finding out what's happening in the best of our suburban schools. It means finding out what's happening in the best of Minneapolis public schools. And it means taking all that information and making sure Minneapolis public schools is building our system based on those principles. It's about what works for kids, what's going to get the best outcome for kids. We have some data now. We need to make sure to get the best data possible, and we need to make sure to bring that to the conversation, all of us, whatever we think we know about education, whatever we think our perspective is, we need to all get to the same table, put the information on there, and decide from there what we're going to do to make sure that our schools are working for all of our children. The future of our city depends on it. Go ahead, Don. I'm sorry, Nakima, could you repeat the options for me, please? So essentially, there are public, charter, private, and parochial schools in the Choice is, Your, Choice is Yours program. Thousands of students from Minneapolis public schools, particularly students of color, are going outside the district or utilizing these other options. So how do these school choices fit into your vision of closing the opportunity gap in the city? Well, let's start with charter schools because that's a good one that um, exemplifies the conundrum uh, because of the way we have interpreted. Charter schools, if you remember, were created here in Minnesota. Uh, a bipartisan agreement as an uh, incubator for new ideas for public schools. And gradually they have become a uh, dead end for good ideas. And they don't get out, and uh, so what's happened instead of the ideas getting out into the public schools, we have kids leaving the public schools to get to where the ideas are. That's not what was intended. And now the tension of competition is creating all kind of friction and, uh, and finger pointing as to who's to blame. But make no mistake about it. People are choosing. Whether or not we have a policy, they're choosing. We have upper middle class people choosing Breck and Blake and the others. We have middle class people choosing to move uh, to schools where the good schools are, and we have poor people sending their kids away from the public schools. And so what we need to do is to do what we intended to at the beginning, to transform what we got by using whatever idea works, wherever it works, make our schools better so our kid can go down the street to a perfectly good school. My daughter, as she does now, should not have to get into a car that I pay for out of my pocket to go to uh, Anthony Middle School in South Minneapolis. That's a crime because my neighbors don't have that option. We need to fix the school around the corner. Yeah, um, I mean, options are great, right? 
There are great charter schools and there are poor charter schools. And there are great public schools and there are poor public schools. Options are good. I think we need to look at, you know, look at some of the best practices, whether it's a charter or within the district, and, and use those policies and those best practices to strengthen, like Don said, strengthen our community schools so that we don't have to, you know, get in that car that Don is paying for to go to school, right? But, you know, I, I talk to parents all the time and they struggle with this. They see their, their kid, their children that have been in their, maybe their community school and then they're ready to graduate maybe to the next school but they're struggling with this decision because they want the best education. It gets back to that quality of life. Everybody wants that for their children. Everybody. I mean, I grew up in small town Iowa on a farm. We didn't have a choice. There was only one school. It was called Columbus Community Schools and it was seven towns all put together to create one school and there were 70 people in my class. So I didn't, I didn't know that there's, when, when you grow up in that environment, you don't know that there's an option and you make do with what's best. Here, we have so many resources. So let's leverage the best and provide options, but work on our lowest performing schools to improve that quality of life. I do support offering parents choices, private, parochial, traditional public, and charter public schools. Did anybody see that slate? article that made the rounds in the past month or so in education circles, the headline was something to the effect of, if you send your kid to private school, you're morally bad. And the point was that all of us should send our kids to the, and send them and only send them to the traditional public school in our neighborhood. I see some nods. This, this piece was making the rounds. The author of that piece clearly didn't have children. I don't say that to knock the author, but it was just evident to me as a parent that this person had never raised kids because I know I'm preaching to the choir of, of the fellow parents in the room when I say, my child's not gonna be a social science experiment. I'm gonna provide my child the best possible education. And I certainly hope that that is in a traditional public school in my child's neighborhood. That's why my wife and I moved to the Fulton neighborhood because it's Lake Harriet Lower, Lake Harriet Upper and the Southwest High School. Fantastic educational opportunities there. But for parents who find themselves in areas in our city where they don't have fantastic traditional public schools, I do support giving them options to send their children to the school that works best for them. And frankly, I'm not sure anybody could oppose that, especially folks who send their kids to private school because they're wealthy. I mean, that's always one of the most galling things. And I've seen folks on the left and folks on the right do this, who send their own children to the Blakes and the Brecks of the world and then preach to others who would do the same. It's hypocritical and it's wrong. Wouldn't it be great if we all had the perfect community school that we could send our kids to down the block, they wouldn't have to get into a bus, they could safely walk to school and get the best possible education. That's a fantastic aspiration. But speaking from my own family experience, I grew up with the Minneapolis public schools. My children went to Minneapolis public schools and the public schools, in the traditional form, haven't always worked, even for my kids. My daughter ended up going to an alternative school in the Minneapolis uh, school district. So I'm a very strong supporter of school choice. I always have been. School choice, we live in a pluralistic society, and our school system is like a many-patterned quilt that has to cover all the distinct and unique needs of all the kids and families in our community. So we need to nurture that. We need to make sure that all of those options are available, all of those opportunities are, avail are available because we need school models that work for our kids, not that just work for a particular system. So very important, I think it's a core value. All of us embrace that as well we should. Thank you, Jackie. I support a wide option of school opportunities for kids, but I also believe that what we need to do is we need to understand that parents are making choices. They're making choices for that which is the most precious part of their life for their children. And we need to help those parents make the best choices and provide them with the best choices possible. 
I know that, I'm a parent, I've made choices for my kid. And you know when you see, uh, I've got a bus stop across the house, or across from my, my house, and on the first day of school, and you see those moms and dads taking their kids to the bus for the first day, you palpably feel the excitement. And when you talk to those moms and dads, as I do regularly in my neighborhood, and say, you know, why are you making the choices you're making? Because we want a smaller class size because we want stability and leadership in the school, because we want to know that that teacher will engage with us in a respectful way and engage with our students and bring out the best in our students, and in many cases because they want a longer school day. That's what parents are looking for. So we need to take some of the learning that we've had from the charter schools and apply it to the public schools, to the more traditional public schools. But let's also remember that charter schools are also public schools. They are not a separate entity. They are public schools, and we need to tr treat them as such and acknowledge them as such. But we also just need to meet people where they're at. We need to talk to parents. We need to say, you're making an important choice. How can we help you make the best choice possible for that which you care the most about, which is your child? Thank you. Let's give all of our candidates a round of applause for their answers during our first round of questioning. It is nice to know that you have each actually thought about these issues. And for those who haven't thought about certain aspects, I think some ideas are being generated um, for hopefully one of you being the next mayor. Next, we're going to transition and um, have some questions from a few of our co-sponsors. The first is Simona Fuller from the Minnesota Minority Education Partnership. Good evening, candidates. Good evening. Good evening. So given that African-American male students are suspended at rates ginormously higher than their peers, which takes them out of the classroom and away from valuable learning opportunities, what will you do as mayor to support Minneapolis public schools in reforming their discipline policies and practices to hopefully address this disproportionate issue? We'll start with you, Don. Well, certainly uh, suspensions are a problem uh, in our schools. African-American boys are suspended seven times the rate of white boys, and uh, that's not acceptable. The very children, in fact, that need the most in times, uh, in school class time, are getting the least because of their behavior. And I see the behavior as a cry for help. And if you have children, and you 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 can see when they act up, something's going on with that kid. If you're a perceptive per parent, you try to find out what that is. So we're going to have to change the paradigm when that cry for help comes comes find a way to have in-school suspensions that we can work with those kids in a way that they don't lose the very kid that needs uh, some attention is going to further be isolated and alienated. We need in-school su suspensions, except for the worst case scenario where the kid is totally pathological. But we, 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 we can, that those kids are very, very, very few kids. And um, that's a mental, another kind of cry for help and there are mental uh, services uh, for that. Thank but kids, you. kids should be, we should put our arms around them when they cry for help. Thank you. And I'd like to remind the candidates that for this round you get 60 seconds to answer the question. So please be succinct. Great. Go ahead, Stephanie. Yes, thank you. Yes, seven times black students are suspended. And that, was, that represented 14% of the total population of the students suspended last year in the district. No wonder why they can't learn. This is an issue. This has got to stop. What I'm going to do as mayor is that I will rally the communities and work with the communities to make sure, because like Don said, this, is, this starts from home, right, in terms of this behavior. And we've got to figure out a way that, that you know, we, we can't socialize this behavior so that kids think that they can just throw a tantrum and then I can get to go home and watch TV all day, right? They need to stay in school. There's other ways to address this. These kids are hungry to learn. They're starving for it. They just don't know how to act. 
because they're not held accountable at home. They're not held accountable at home because their parents weren't held accountable at home. And their parents probably weren't held accountable at home. They're starving for leadership around this. And this, is, this isn't rocket scientists. This Thank is just you. parenting in the schools. Thank you. Cam. From speaking with folks and reading some of the literature on the high suspension rate of African American males, it seems to me there are four key things we can do. First, engagement. Engaging with students to make their education seem more relevant and exciting to them. To help students understand that their actions in school can yield great benefits for them when they're done with school. We could spend an hour in engagement, but I only got 60 seconds for the whole thing. So that's one, engagement. Two, when we're disciplining, the discipline has to be consistent throughout the entire school. Can you imagine going from classroom to classroom to classroom and having different rules each time? Discipline has to be consistent across the school. Three, training teachers in how to discipline effectively, making it so that their first response is not to throw somebody out, but instead teaching them to defuse conflicts, the same way we need to do a better job of teaching police officers to defuse conflicts rather than escalating them. Fourth and finally, as Councilmember Samuels mentioned, providing those necessary mental health support services so that when the acting out behavior sometimes is a symptom of mental health issues, we're treating that underlying cause, not just the symptom of it. Thank you. Go ahead, Mark. Obviously, suspensions, especially African American suspensions in our Minneapolis schools, is a problem that has to be dealt with. One of the solutions I want to pursue is a zero suspension policy in the Minneapolis public schools. I want to consider a zero suspension policy in the Minneapolis public schools because I want to be a mayor who's known for keeping kids in school, not supporting ways to throw kids out of school. I don't think, I don't think that's the right answer. And I really love the initiative, the Be In School initiative, which is a collaboration of the Minneapolis Youth Coordinating Board. I was a co-founder of the Minneapolis Youth Coordinating Board and served on that board for its first seven years of existence. That partnership can be with the YCB, Minneapolis Public Schools, State of Minnesota, and the City of Minneapolis, and we can devise the socializing programmatic um, initiatives that will allow those kids to be in school and learning and still gaining the therapeutic work that they may need as a result of their behavior. It's Thank not you. okay just to throw people out of school and, that'll, and, and wash our hands of it. Thank you. Jackie. You know, suspension makes absolutely no sense to me at all. So kids are coming to school to learn. They're already, in some cases, behind. And then you're going to send them home where they're going to get further behind because they're not in school. That doesn't make any logical sense at all. And we need to figure out a way for that to stop. I respect that the superintendent and the board can figure out some policies to institute so that we don't have suspensions like that. Zero suspension is a great goal. But the other thing we need to do is we need to have culturally competent teachers in the classrooms. Yeah. And if you, haven't, if you haven't read the article from the New York Times Magazine yesterday on social emotional learning, you need to read that. That is the guide for how we work with kids who come to school in survival mode. They're coming from absolute chaos. So if you're in absolute chaos, if you've got a fight with mom and dad going on in the morning and then you're supposed to learn, that doesn't work. Thank you. Well, this issue, this issue hits close to home for me. When I got married a couple years ago, I became a grandmother to four and two of them are African-American boys in the Minneapolis public schools there at Wyndham. And if Luke and Lyric started coming home and being suspended all the time, I would immediately want to know why, and I would not immediately assume, um, I would not immediately assume that it was a problem with them or a problem with their teachers. I'd want to look at what's going on in that school, what's going on for those boys because we can't assume that there's something wrong with the kids so that they're getting suspended all the time. 
we have to assume that we have to look at the full 360 degree picture of what's going on in a kid's life, but we also have to make sure that the classrooms are set up well to handle the 360 degree look at whatever's going on in a kid's life. And that has to include teachers having flexibility in their discipline, flexibility in how they manage the classroom. But yes, it also means that we have teachers that look like those students. It means we have teachers that are trained in cultural competency to make sure they can handle situations that arise. And we also Thank need to you. start creating teachers from the Minneapolis public school system that come back and teach in the Minneapolis public school system. Thank you. Um, I'm going to have Kenneth Eban come up from Students for Education Reform, and as he's coming up, I want to thank Simone for bringing this issue to our attention. It's one that I know as African Americans is a very difficult discussion to have because so often the assumption is that parents are not doing what they're supposed to do at home, and that's why these disparities exist. Um, I saw a number of African Americans in the audience nodding their head, um, really with a sense of frustration because of some of the misperceptions that are out there um, in terms of what happens if you're from a poor ba background. And I will say for myself, you may not know it by my title, but I'm from South Central Los Angeles, which is one of the poorest communities in the country, raised by a single mom, and here I am today as a law professor. <laughs> So I'm throwing that out there because, again, this isn't about having a false sense of peace without tension. This is about putting these issues out there for us to understand what's happening and then be willing to dig deeper, ask the tough questions, and to be uncomfortable. So thank you, Simone, for raising that issue. Just grab that microphone, Kenny. Just pull it. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so. My question is, MPS has publicly committed to transform the relationships and partnerships with families as outlined in their strategic plan. But just last week, the board voted on a process to fill the vacant seat in District 3 without any consideration of community input in the process. Using your office as mayor, how would you work with the district to ensure that communities are driving the decisions that most clearly and directly impact them? Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. I mean, that, that is the number one role of the mayor, since I don't have authority over the schools, that that will be the number one to rally the communities to make sure that they have a voice. That's it. Because remember, I'm deferring half of my salary on this, right? So I have, a, I have my skin in the game. So I have a vested interest here. I'm gonna meet with every single neighborhood to make sure that they are a partner, to make sure that their voice is heard, because they have got to have skin in the game, right? The majority of the residents that live in Minneapolis don't have skin in the game on this issue because they don't attend the public school. So all the more reason why the, the, the communities that do have to be fully engaged so that everybody, everybody has a voice, so that everybody wins. What was your name again, sir? Kenneth. Kenneth. Uh, on the particular issue that you mentioned, Kenneth, th there's been a lot of uh, tension and turmoil about how Hussein Samatar's seat will be filled. And I, I know I'm speaking for every person in this room when I say what a terrible tragedy that we lost Hussein Samatar so young. Uh, he was an exemplary member of our overall community, the small American community, the new American communities, and it's just a tragedy. And I know I'm speaking for everybody when I say that. There's some he said, he said regarding how exactly the discussions went at the school board meeting. So I'm not going to get into that. I respect everybody involved, and I wasn't there, so I'm not sure who said what. But the broader point is this. Let's say I'm mayor right now. If the stakeholders wanted me to convene a forum, hey, let's go to Chipotle or the mayor's office or take a walk across the Stone Arch Bridge, and I can act as a convener to bring folks together to say, how can we best fill this spot in a way that gets the spot filled and does it in a way where the community feels empowered. But it also speaks to the importance of the mayor having direct appointments to the school board. And I'm out of time, so I'll cover that more in a bit. Thank you. Go ahead, Mark. 
speaking to the vacancy, there are a couple of things that probably ought to happen. I mean, one thing that should be talked about is whether or not there ought to be a change in state law on filling these vacancies. I think that's a good public discussion for us to have. In the absence of that happening, I think the board has an obligation and the city has a responsibility collectively to make sure the public uh, knows that the vacancy is there and what it is they are looking for in a school board member. I have a great deal of respect to the people who serve our school district in elected office, as well as for the superintendent. They do a good job in almost impossible circumstances, but there is talent out there in the community, a lot of talent out there in the community. And part of what we all talk about when we want to be change agents, we want to be change agents. Part of what we're talking about is, is a making it possible for people to be inspired enough to step up and run. And I think that's a very important opportunity and a great opportunity for the city to encourage. You know, I think the broader question is, how do you engage the community in discussions? How do you engage the community in what's going on in the schools? And you know, I'm one of those people, I come at this from a community organizing perspective. Nothing good happens, nothing good happens, no good decisions are made unless you involve the people who are affected by those decisions. It's just kind of as simple as that. I had a, a, a colleague on the city council when I was the council president, Walt Diedzik, and I would, he would, we would hold these public hearings and his line to me early on was, always let the public speak. I don't care how bored you are with them, I don't care if you don't want to hear, I don't care how tired you are, always let the public speak. Because the public is smart, and the public knows how to engage, we have to engage them. I think the schools could do a better job of engaging the public. I see it in my neighborhood. Folks don't ask what the parents are thinking, what the parents want to be involved in. I think there are opportunities to involve the public through the churches, through our neighborhood organizations, and just by going out and meeting with people on a regular basis, asking them what they think, because you can't make good decisions in any level of government unless you talk to folks, unless you listen to folks. Thank you. Betsy? This is a question where we get to pan back because yes, it's a question about, you know, what is the process gonna be to fill uh, 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 Hussein Samatar's seat? But when you pan back, it really is a question about how are you gonna engage the community and how do you engage parents in the process of governing the Minneapolis public schools? That's one of the big questions on the table and it will absolutely be on the table at Mayor Hodge's table on education. And we all have to come together and we all have to demand the kind of public communication and the kind of parental engagement that's gonna get the best possible results for kids, the best possible results for our kids in our schools. And that means dis deciding together what does that process look like, knowing fundamentally that children do better when their parents are engaged in the schools, and knowing that one of the roles of the school is to make it as easy as possible and as inviting as possible to bring parents into the process. People are working very hard on this every day, but it is one of the crucial questions because we know that it is one of the drivers of the best possible outcomes for our kids. Thank you. John? Well, I, you know, I don't want to micromanage the uh, public school at this level. But I think a good idea would be to do something like we do when we elect uh, or select a new uh, superintendent. We take her around to different uh, community groups, introduce her to the community, and give everybody a chance to ask questions and get answers, at least, since this is not an election. Because it's an important position, and the incumbent does have an advantage in the next election, and so the public needs to have some kind of input. But to the larger question, I do think um, uh, as mayor, I'm going to be uniquely positioned to address the issues of parent engagement. I live in the community where most of the parents are disadvantaged. My plan is to be vocal, to show up at churches, to show up at groups, social groups, and to have a column, yes, Steve Brandt, in the Star Tribune if they'll let me, um, <laughs> uh, on, on um, parenting for academic success. And, um, 
and, and make it a regular thing. We're going to have to give parents the information they need about schools, about their activities with their children that will lead to academic success. Then when parents are engaged, you, you can't stop them. Thank you. Thank you for asking that question. Next we'll have Linnell Mapleton. Put kids first, Minneapolis. Thanks, I'm gonna be asking two questions that specifically relate to hiring and retaining the most effective teachers we can, especially teachers of color. I ask this in part because 85% of our classroom teachers are currently white. We have 70% of our uh, students are kids of color. I believe when you get down to African American males, 1.6% of our teachers are African American males. So the question is first, do you support the policy of last in, first out seniority layoffs? I ask this in the context because between 2001 and 2012, we lost half of our teachers of color in terms of raw numbers due to seniority layoffs. The second question is, TFA has been in the news lately. Um, TFA recruits far more teachers of color than our traditional education schools. So, first one is, do you support last and first out policies? And the second one, do you support hiring TFA teachers in Minneapolis public schools? I oppose last in, first out categorically. And I think our city missed an opportunity a couple of years ago when the bill went through both houses of the state legislature, a bill that would have ended last in, first out. And that bill ended up on the desk of Governor Dayton, whom I respect. Governor Dayton's a good man. Governor Dayton vetoed that bill. Let's not kid ourselves. Governor Dayton vetoed that bill because he wants campaign contributions from the Minneapolis Federation of Teachers and Education in Minnesota. He's playing hardball politics, that's fine. If I had been the mayor, and when I'm the mayor and this bill goes through the House's legislature again, I'll be there meeting with Governor Dayton to say, Governor Dayton, for the good of the kids in Minneapolis, sign this bill, sir. And if you're gonna lose two million bucks in contributions from those parties I mentioned, I'll get you four million bucks in campaign contributions from the forces of ed reform. If you want to play hardball politics, let's play it in a win-win way. <laughs> and yes, I support the inclusion of Teach for America teachers in our schools and the inclusion of any other solution that together can solve the greatest moral challenge of our time, and that is the opportunity and achievement gap. Thank you. <laughs> Stephanie? Stephanie? Oh, sorry. Oh. Okay. Go ahead. I didn't hear you. Sorry. Yes, I oppose, with Cam, I oppose last in, first out. Teacher Max teachers. The, yeah, teach, and, and teach at TFA. I, I, I support TFA, Teach for America teachers, definitely. I mean, we've got to have flexibility here, right? There are a lot of smart people. There's, there's the only way to solve this problem is to pick a little bit of everything and make sure that we can be successful. We cannot be so rigid. We've got to be flexible here. And we have to ensure that you know, performance is a big part of this. Not seniority, but performance. This is no different like in business, right? If you don't perform, what happens eventually? You're probably gonna go out of business. And this is no different. The, our kids are going out of business. We're churning out 50% of our kids are not succeeding. If you run a business that way, what happens over time? Nobody's gonna buy your product. You will go out of business, and the taxpayers in Minneapolis can't afford it anymore. This city can't afford it anymore. This is our greatest economic opportunity, is to make sure that we become the smartest city. And if that means that we have flexibility in how we hire and how we fire, and the types of teachers and where we pull them from, then we have to do it. There's Thank no you. other way. Thank you. Don? Yeah, well, you know, last in, first out is the most ridiculous piece of policy in the, in the teacher's contract. And it has to go. It's totally absurd. That's why my wife and I went to the Capitol several times during that session and testified for its uh, 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 getting rid of it. So, you know, as mayor, I'm going to be on the front lines and I'm going back to the Capitol, but this time I'm going to have all of you with me and the people of Minneapolis. And we're going to end that thing. And then um, teacher, uh, teach, teach for America. 
Oh, I've been love, in love with Teach for America forever. I'm on the board of Teach for America. A young man just shook my hand back there today and said, thank you for coming to speak to the Board of Teaching so that we could be hired for the school we wanted to be in. I'm on the front line. This is not a philosophical conversation for me. It's not a, an idea. It's not a philosophy. I am in the trenches, been in the trenches, and I will stay in the trenches to make sure nothing stands in the way of transformation and reform. Teach for, Amer Teach for America is not the problem. Teach for America is not the solution. And the debate about Teach for America that adults are having is often a mask for this question about how we get more diversity in the classroom and whether we need more diversity in the classroom. And the answer to the question of do we need more diversity in the classroom is yes. We know that it works for students of color to have, to have teachers who look like them. And that is not what we have in the Minneapolis public schools right now. And what that means, if we are going to have a child-centered conversation about the Minneapolis public schools, we are going to have to come together as adults and put every single thing on the table to get the teachers that our kids need. We don't have to put adults and teachers by the wayside to make that happen. But last in, first out, the extent to which that goes against our goal of as much diversity in the teaching core as we have is the extent to which we have to put it on the table and figure out something that works better. For every problem, there is a solution better than the one that didn't work. It is the adult's job to come to the table and find that solution. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, let me apologize. I am going to have to leave in about two minutes. As soon as I'm done speaking, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but uh, I was scheduled for a screening with AFSME. Now, why AFSME schedule their screenings the same evening as this, I am not at all sure, but I drew the first one up, so I have to get over there. First of all, I oppose last in, first out, very clearly. Secondly, I am from a long line of educators. Uh, both of my parents were teachers. All of my cousins in North Dakota are teachers part-time and farmers part-time, because that's what you do in North Dakota. You do it depending on the season. So I'm from a long line of educators. And frankly, you know, I think that the profession of teaching has not been respected and paid the way that it should be paid. It's a profession the same as being a doctor or an engineer or a lawyer or anything else. In many cases, it's much more difficult. And frankly, I'm just going to be real honest, I think one of the reasons it hasn't been respected is because it's largely women that go into that profession. So that being said, I support teachers. I think we have to put everything on the table we can to get diversity in teaching. And that means we have to uh, support Teach for America. But we also have to figure out how do we attract young people of color in the college system. And I was on the Board of Regents at Augsburg College where we did some great work working with bringing young people of color, that, that situation primarily native students, and helping them understand and wanting to be part of the teaching profession. So with that, I am going to excuse myself. Thank you so much for your time this evening. It's an, an issue that I'm absolutely committed to. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Mark? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jackie. Uh, Teach for America. Clearly, Teach for America is part of the solution. We have some of the I know people whose kids are Teach for America's, I know uh, kids who are Teach for America teachers. They are truly among the best and the brightest among us. That is not something we want to reject. It is something we want to nurture. So part of the solution, yes, a multiplicity of opportunities and options also part of the solution. I also support reforms in LIFO. Uh, that means a lot of it done at the negotiating table. I favor keeping it at the negotiating table for a while because progress is being made. There are two things happening that I think are very noteworthy. One, progress is being made. There are 63 teachers who got evaluated and got the HEFO last year because they did not make the grade. And there are going to be more coming next year. So clearly there is movement happening there. I think it's very important. The second thing we want to note is we are now in an era of teacher hiring. So the importance of this issue as a wedge issue in this debate, and let's be clear, it is a major wedge issue, 
Because we are in a hiring cycle, the significance of this issue, I think, is going to diminish to a certain point, but I want to keep the pressure on, I want to build the eval tools, and I want to make sure that we get rid of teachers who aren't working and respect and uh, honor the ones that are. All right, thank you. So now we're going to transition um, into a lightning round. I'm going to ask two questions that simply require a yes or no answer, and a third question that is multiple choice. I think the organizers wanted to have a little fun with you tonight. <laughs> So uh, we'll start with you, Mark. Do you support closing persistently low-performing public charter schools after intervention efforts have been unsuccessful? Yes. Betsy. Yes. 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 Question number two, we'll start with Betsy. Do you support closing persistently low-performing traditional district schools after intervention efforts have been unsuccessful? Yes. 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 Wow, this is easier than I thought it would be. <laughs> I thought I'd have to pull pry some people from the microphone. Okay, so in regards, this is a multiple choice question. In regards to the structure of the school board, would you support A, a mayoral appointed school board, B, a hybrid with some elected seats and some mayoral appointed seats, or C, leaving the structure as it currently is? We'll start with you, Don. C. C. Hybrid. C. C. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, now we will transition to our closing remarks. So in two minutes, share your assessment of the current state of K-12 through education for students living in Minneapolis and your vision for that system in 2018 at the end of your first term. Do I need to repeat it or is that clear? Okay, we'll start with you, Don. Well, thanks for having me and thanks for being patient. I'm very excited about this race, especially since our mayor, current mayor, has uh, said the next mayor has to be an education mayor and that if there's one mistake he's made is to not have a prioritized education from the get-go. I'm very glad to hear that. I'm also glad to hear a former mayor, uh, uh, Fraser, stand with me as I unveiled my education policy statement on the steps of Harvest Prep, one of the high achieving schools, beat the odds, and say this is the best education policy of the bunch. I'm also proud to hear, see in today's paper, where education ranked at the top of the priorities of the people of this, uh, the voters of this city, uh, and, and right onto that public safety because those are the two things I've been preaching since this campaign began. I've been preaching them before this campaign began. I came into office because of these two issues, because I know that sustainable economic development is hinged on our, how well our schools do and how safe our neighborhoods are. <laughs> Everything else is building on a sandy foundation. It can't work. You can't throw away children and expect your community to work. That's why I'm so excited that I am ascending while the issue is ascending. It's an incredible thing. I love it. And let me say, at the beginning, at the beginning of our campaign, uh, uh, I had to remind uh, Cam a couple times that, no, Cam, you're not the only one talking about education because there was so much silence around education, he thought he was the only one. We were the only two talking about education. <laughs> and, then I jumped in. <laughs> and, then, and then Stephanie jumped in. But, I, <laughs> but, but let me tell you, I didn't just begin talking about education. I've been working on education for generations. It is unacceptable what's happening now. It's intolerable. It must stop now. And when I am mayor, you will go to a high school graduation from North High, Harvest Prep, from, from uh, Patrick Henry, Tom. and you'll see African-American kids throwing their hats up in the air, 100% of them <laughs> walking down the aisle receiving their diplomas. It's going to be incredible. It feels like we need to pass a collection plate. That sounded like a sermon, but thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> wow. And yes, I did jump in. I jumped in late, and this is the only reason why I jumped in. My platform, like I mentioned earlier, is to make Minneapolis the smartest city in America. 
It's great to be the greenest city or the most progressive city, but Minneapolis has got to become the smartest city in America. That's our largest economic opportunity. I come from the business world, I understand that. But our children are starving, they're hungry for leadership around this. It's unacceptable that we have such a precious asset, yet we are the worst in the nation, the worst. This, this city, City Hall and this mayor has been complacent when it comes to this issue in terms of leadership. Enough is enough. How many, let me ask, I wanna see a, a show of hands here. How many people have ever, ever experienced hunger? Like hungry for a meal or maybe hunger for a new job or hunger for maybe the acceptance of your parents or maybe you've, you've been hungry for, maybe you've lost a love or, I mean, any, let me see your hands. Come on, I'm on it, let me just see. So you know what that feeling is. You know what it is inside. And 22% of our students of color can read and write. That's 78% of our students cannot read and write. That's almost 21,000 students a year. That's negligent, that's almost criminal. Because what happens to those students? They end up on the street. That's the only place that they end up. That is, the, this is the only reason why I'm running. I've never run for office before. I know that I have an uphill battle. I have been talking about this from day one. When Min posted the, the article when I first launched, the headline was Woodruff says, achievement gap is the greatest opportunity. And I remember people on Twitter laughing at me because they said, oh, she doesn't understand that the mayor doesn't have any control over this. What does she think she's doing? This is exactly what I'm doing. I am demanding results because this is what I do for a living. Thank you. Cam. Yep. Oftentimes when we are arranged as candidates, I follow Don. There is no earthly way to follow Don Samuels when it comes to speaking on this topic. And as much as I love him, Stephanie, I'm kind of glad that you had the tough task of following Don's passion on this. I've been watching Don Samuels for years, and Sandra, as they've committed their lives to making the changes that we're discussing here. And, and I, in turn, yeah, brought, yeah, let's clap for them. And I have brought my own experiences to the, to the table. As I shared with you, I'm a public school kid who went on and got three degrees because of the great public school education I got. And at each turn, I have tried to pay those opportunities forward. As an attorney at a law firm here in town, representing the underdog and big corporations and everybody in between. At the wind turbine maintenance company that my colleagues and I built with 120 employees, many of them coming from Bowtech School. And when we sold our company to the largest utility in the world recently, Every single employee kept his or her job, and every single employee was able to share in the benefits of the sale because they'd had a Votech education that prepared them to seize opportunities themselves. And so now I'm seeking to seize this opportunity now myself to bring fresh eyes to City Hall. We have massive challenges as a city, and with great respect to my opponents, I submit that we cannot keep electing the same folks again and again and expect to get different results. I am fiscally responsible. I am socially inclusive. People say, aren't you the Republican? And I say, sure, I've done some work in the Republican Party. And I also stand fiercely for marriage equality, always have. And I've devoted a good chunk of my professional career to trying to make wind-generated electricity cost competitive and reliable. I am fiscally responsible. I am socially inclusive. I know how good I've had it. And as mayor, I'll seek to pay back every one of those opportunities tenfold. I'm Cam Winton, and I ask for your vote. Thank you. Mark? I'm running for mayor because I have a big, bold vision for our city and a proven record to back it up. Not only was I the creator of the recycling program in Minneapolis and Hennepin County, the creator of the Midtown Greenway, one of the pioneers on light rail transit, but I bring to the table collaboration skills that are superb and proven and have lasted the test of time. I was one of the major reformers in welfare reform. I served on the governor's 
Blue Ribbon Commission on Welfare Reform that created MFIP. And I work side by side with Republicans and Democrats and reformers and bureaucrats. And we hammered out a welfare reform policy that stands to this day. And I am proud of that work. I will do the same thing with education. I look around this room and I am inspired. I am inspired by the people who care so deeply about our city and the children who inhabit it and who care about helping to build a better future for our people. I have done that. I will continue to do that. I will work tirelessly without any ties to any particular vantage point to build programs that will make our children more ready for school and higher performing students once they get there. It's an honor for me to have been born and raised in this city. I think I'm the only one here whose kids went to public schools in Minneapolis. It's been a wonderful opportunity and we still have great schools today, but they're hurting and they're in pain and many of our families are in pain and there isn't a one size all solution to these problems. It is a collaborative challenge that's going to require the uh, innovators and the free thinkers and the system and the legislators and the policy makers and most importantly the parents, families and children and I believe deep down in my heart of hearts that if I am the mayor I will lead on this issue, Thank you. we will achieve progress and by the time we stand for re-election we can point to major demonstrated progress. Thank you. I'm running for mayor to build and grow the city of Minneapolis into the future, to become no less than the greatest city. But to become the greatest city, we have to take on our greatest challenge, and that is the huge chasm we have between people of color and white people in the city of Minneapolis. Health housing, employment, you name it, nowhere more urgent, nowhere more poignant than it is in education. We will not become the greatest city if we do not take care of our children. And in 2018, I want us to have done nothing less than be a beacon of hope for every other city around the country on how to get good results for all of the children in the Minneapolis public schools. And make no mistake, I said it before and I will say it again, this is personal to me. I have two African-American grandsons in the Minneapolis public schools and I will fight like hell for them every single day and by doing so, I will be fighting like hell for every kid in the Minneapolis public school system. That is the pledge that I bring to the table. And given the nature of this debate, we need three key things in the next mayor of the city of Minneapolis. First, the biggest possible vision for our kids, focusing the conversation on great outcomes for our kids and what it's going to take to get there. We need the urgency. We need to be willing to challenge ourselves. We need to be willing and able to do something, and I bring that urgency. I am willing to challenge myself, and I will act. We need a mayor who hasn't picked a side. I have not. I submit to you that child-centered knows no side, and the extent to which folks say that I have is the extent to which this debate has devolved into some other kind of conversation that's gotten too far away from our kids. And finally, thank you. And finally, we need a mayor who says the same thing wherever she goes. I don't go to a labor forum with a union audience and say one thing and come here where there is largely a quote unquote reform audience and say something different. I say the exact same thing wherever I go. It's the only way people are going to trust enough to come to the table when Mayor Hodges convenes that table to talk about our most urgent, urgent issue, which is the future of the city embodied in making sure every kid in the Minneapolis public schools is getting a great education and a great future. Thank you. Please join me in giving all of our candidates a rousing round of applause. Thank you all for bringing your passion and energy to the table on behalf of our children. I'm going to quickly turn it over to Daniel Sellers, who will close us out. Thank you. And how about a big round of applause for our moderator, Dr. Nakeem Levy Pounds.
Thank you again to the candidates. Thank you all for coming out. Stay for a drink, stay in network, get home safely, have a good night.